Be seated, please. I want to invite you to turn again to the book of Psalms. Um, and we're going to look at the very first Psalm today, uh, as I mentioned to the children. Uh, I've been, I, I, we, we started just two weeks ago. Uh, I wanted to do this summer in the Psalms, uh, and I've yet to lay out the whole summer which ones we're going to do. In fact, uh, uh, one of, uh, I played golf this week with three other pastors, and um, uh, when I said I was going to preach in the Psalms, and they were like, that's a long summer. There's 150 of them. Um, we are not going to take 150 Sundays um, in the Psalms, and so I, I want to pick a few, and I'm uh, beginning to appreciate how difficult that is um, uh, to pick which ones and try to make sense. And so I've kind of given up on um, trying to do it uh, thematically or uh, there's a lot of technicalities about you can take what type of psalm or do them in numerical order. I started two weeks ago in Psalm 63. Um, and we talked about what it meant to have a thirsty soul that David writes about being separated from the worship of God and by extension sort of being with the people of God in worship, that it was like being in a dry and weary land. Well, I decided to go with Psalm 1 because it also, I think, uh, paints the picture of without being in right relationship with God, we also find ourselves dry and weary and really in this psalm maybe withered um, and dried up and blown away. And so uh, we emphasize in Psalm 63 that we can be dry and weary because we're not attending to our soul as one of God's people. This psalm, like many places in the scripture, would have us ask, am I dry and weary in my soul because I don't belong to Jesus Christ? Because I'm not in right relationship. And if I am in right relationship with God, what should some of the things uh, uh, about me be, what things should be true uh, about me? Um, now, before we read this psalm, um, there is a, uh, the very first word of this psalm is blessed. Um, and I'm always um, kind of mystified as to at what time in reading the Bible is it blessed and at what time is it blessed. Um, and I'm not sure I've figured that out yet. Um, certain songs, blessed assurance, um, we all say it that way. Um, and other times we say blessed. So whether you're a blessed or a blessed person, let's start with what does that mean to be blessed before we get into this song. Now, it's become in vogue uh, recently. You've probably heard this um, pretty frequently these days. And I think it's a relatively new, I don't think this has always been a thing, but you've probably been told by some Somebody, have a blessed day. You've heard that? Um, in fact, it's been common even in commerce. You'll go in a, in a store and um, when you get your change back from paying for something, you say, thanks, have a good day. You might get the response, have a blessed day. Now, uh, probably to nobody's surprise, um, if you read uh, certain uh, areas in the internet, some people are not a fan of being told, have a blessed day day, which is proof of you can find somebody that gets upset over literally almost anything. Um, I read one person, um, I, I, I did kind of go down that wormhole of the internet about who would say such a thing. Well, it, was, it ran the gamut from number one is how can you wish everybody the exact same thing? Everybody's day's not the same. They couldn't even understand the logic of, well, if you're not having a good day, I'm wishing that it would be better. But they didn't like it if I'm having a bad day. Don't tell me to have a blessed day because my day's not blessed. And of course, there was an atheist response is, don't involve me in your religion. Blessed is a religious word, and I don't want to have anything to do with that. And then you start reading the chats and things like that back and forth. It devolves um, from that. Who could object to being wished a blessed day? Well, apparently lots of people. But here's what blessed ought to mean for us. In fact, we find it uh, very uh, well known in this passage. Blessed is the man or the person, we could say here. Um, we know it uh, very uh, well from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are, uh, and on and on in the Beatitudes they're called there. But here, it's simply 
um, some sense of this. In fact, depending on the translation you have in front of you, the first word of Psalm 1 might be happy. And a lot of people shy away from that a little bit because happy has uh, much more of a feeling to it. That I feel happy. And you can be blessed and not be happy. I'm not sure you can be happy and not understand being blessed. But it also has to do maybe with being fortunate or prosperous or enviable in other people's eyes. In fact, Vines, um, who gives a lot of biblical definition things, says basically this word connotes a, a, a state of prosperity or happiness that comes, and here's a key thing, from a superior bestowing his favor upon one, his blessing on someone. We might even uh, sometimes use this word to say empowered Um, And I like those things because it speaks more than of somebody's condition. You could say, I'm having a blessed day if you're having a good day, but I think by the psalmist definition, you could have a blessed day and it not be one of the good days in your life. So it's a condition rather than a feeling. It's a deep-seated sense of well-being. It's knowing where we reside. Now here's what one person points out. I thought this was a very good observation of the human condition. God made us for blessedness or for happiness. I think that's God's intention for his people. We are to delight not only in the law of the Lord but in many things. Every man, every person feels a desire to be happy. Um, Now, we might have accused, you know, it's almost a a sitcom kind of thing. Do you not want to be happy? Sometimes you say with people who just always look for those ways to be unhappy. But I think deep down, we all have a desire to be happy. All human beings um, abhor or hate being miserable. In fact, most of us spend a lot of our time trying to be happy rather than miserable. But here's the thing. Happiness is the grand object of our pursuit But so perverted is the human heart, one person says, that it seeks happiness where it cannot be found. And in things which are naturally and morally unfit to communicate it to us. The true way of obtaining happiness, blessedness, is laid down here in this psalm. Now, I mentioned that in passing two weeks ago when we talked about uh, the thirst of our souls. Um, uh, Max Lucado in a book called Come Thirsty points out the fact that um, uh, lots of us being thirsty, in this case for blessedness and happiness, will sip from any old tainted brackish water we find laying around. Because we are so desperate for it, we'll take anything that we can get and we miss the living water that will cause us to never thirst again. And it reminds us of Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. So this psalm begins with blessedness. It ends with the word perish. And these are two ways. In fact, as we uh, ponder these precious words, Uh, I think we should have trembling hearts before the Lord that we would experience not just life, but we'll have life in Christ, that we will receive the blessedness of God through Jesus Christ, an abundant life that the New Testament promises to us, life which is blessed upon blessings. In fact, uh, the very first word that we say here um, is a superlative that is actually a double word. Blessed, blessed. The blessednesses, um, one person translates it. It's meant to be a strong term. Very blessed, extremely blessed is the man. So let's read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God bless for us his word today. Let's start 
at the beginning here. Um, and uh, overall, again, this psalm gives us two ways, two men, two people, two ways, two destinies. And the contrast is meant to be obvious to us here. There's a way to be blessed and there's a way to stand under wrath and judgment. And the Bible often uses those twos. In fact, we point that out regularly here, that there are two conditions of man. There's no areas in between. Either we stand justified and right before God through Jesus Christ, or we don't. And in that sense, either you're blessed or you're not. The righteous and the wicked are two distinct categories. We're not more or less righteous in God's eyes. We are either righteous or we're not. And I hope if you've sat under our preaching here regularly, you know that we are not made righteous by what we do. We are made righteous by who we are. If we belong to God, if he's chosen us, if he's redeemed us by the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit resides in us, then we are indeed blessed both in this life and in the next. If we don't know Jesus as our Savior, if I've not admitted myself to be a sinner incapable of saving myself, then I am numbered among the wicked. It's only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we can be righteous before God. Now this psalm has to do with the things that ought to be true about those who belong to God, those who are in Jesus Christ, and what is normally true of those who are not. And it's certainly not a prescription for earning our way into salvation. These twos in scriptures separate us um, in those distinct categories over and over and over. And I won't go into the story behind all of these, but just think about a few from the very beginning of the Bible to the end. In the very third chapter in the beginning of the Bible, we read about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There's two distinct destinies uh, for those who belong to God and those who don't. We have the first and the last Adam that we find ourselves connected to. Even the first uh, family in the Bible, Cain and Abel, are separated in righteousness and judgment. Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau, even the first kings of Saul and of David. In the New Testament, we find all the illustrations of what it means to be right with God and not. The foundations of the sand and the rock the, uh, upon which we build. The flesh and the spirit. Life and death. Salvation and judgment. And if nothing else, this psalm, that's almost an introduction to the whole book of 150 psalms, says here is something worth knowing. This poem, this song says to us, there are two ways, two destinies, two people. And then it says this to us. Blessed is the one, blessed is the man, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of sinners, who does not sit in the seat of scoffers or mockers, your version may say. I preached this same psalm to you two and a half years ago. I'm sure some of you remember it well. Um, it was on December 30th, two and a half years ago. It was on the precipice of a new year. And we pointed out that in each new year, when we look at resolutions and um, new things we're going to do or old things we're not going to do anymore, this psalm reminds us is what ought to be true about us. And the very first thing is that we don't do these things. And I love how uh, a preacher named Alan Carr puts this. He says that the the people who belong to God, the people who are in right standing with God, these first three things, walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, and sitting in the seat of mockers could be summarized this way. Those who belong to God do not believe like the wicked, they do not behave like the wicked, and they do not belong with the wicked. There's a way in which the things about us the things that we say, the things that we believe, the things that we participate in, every aspect of our life ought to be defined and um, it ought to be a display of what is in our hearts, in our lives. And we shouldn't behave like the world does. We shouldn't believe like the world does and we certainly don't belong with them. We are different in that. That's the negative. That's what we don't do. And the Bible spends 66 books there describing those types of things. 
But what is true on the positive side is what it says next. But it's not those things, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. I shared a little bit of that in the children's sermon already. What does it mean to delight and to meditate? And we could spend lots and lots of time talking about those things. But let's just say at least this is to delight in something shows great favor towards us. I don't think you need to dig into Greek and Hebrew and other things like that to understand what it means to delight. Some of you have lots of things you delight in. Some of you, uh, particularly here, have children and grandchildren who you delight in. That means not only you don't just enjoy them, but you are connected to them in a very special way. Um, Let's use the grandparent illustration for a while. I bet you a number of you have found yourself delighting in something that you never ever dreamed you would delight in because of your connection to it. Some of you have sat through things like dance recitals, piano recitals, cheerleading competitions, um, uh, 108 degree sweltering soccer and baseball games, and you took delight in being there. Why? Because of your connection and your relationship with someone to it. And I bet going through your heart and mind right now, I can think of a hundred things. And it might not be, grandchildren might be an easy one. Some of you delight in the career path that you've chosen. And other people go, I cannot understand why anybody would want to do that all day, every day. And yet you do because it's part of your calling. It's part of who we are. So delighting in something then, really, a delight is an attitude that then leads to action. If, going back to our grandparent illustration, if you said you delighted in your grandchildren, and yet you never talked to them, you never see them, you didn't ever want to participate in anything they were on, wouldn't somebody naturally and probably rightfully so say, do you really delight in them? That gets back to what we talked about two weeks ago. A dry and weary soul can be a sign of not delighting in the things of God, in the word of God, in the people of God, and particularly in the worship of God. Delight is a permanent pleasure, um, one person says, and not dependent upon sudden excitement. If we delight in something, we always delight in it, and we anticipate it, we long for it. That's part of the thirst that we ought to have. And really when it says his delight is in the law of the Lord, yes, it means maybe technically the laws of God, the Ten Commandments and the other thing. It probably almost assuredly refers to the whole Old Testament, maybe even all of God's word, we delight in that. But if we delight in all those things, it means first and foremost, we delight in God himself above all things. And I've said to you before from this pulpit is some of us don't value the things of God because we don't love Jesus more than we love this world. And this psalm could be boiled down to that. If we value and love Jesus above all things, then we will be present for the things of God. We will be diligent about the things of God. And and yet... Excuse me. And yes, that's a process that takes place. Not everybody delights in the same way throughout their whole entire Christian life. If you're in one of those dry and weary seasons, God says, come and drink deeply at the fountain of life in Jesus Christ. Don't wander in the desert weary and tired. Come to Jesus and drink. But if that's true, that we are created for that kind of blessedness, we are in relationship in a way that draws us to that, um, then we will be um, like that next stanza says, and we'll come back to this at the very end, you will be like a tree planted by streams of water producing fruit. But let's look at the contrast very quickly first. Not so the wicked, the NIV says. I like that better. Not so being at the beginning of that verse. But the wicked are not like that. What does that mean? What are the wicked not like? Well, they don't delight in the law of the Lord. They don't meditate on it day and night. And this 
word wicked is an adjective meaning unrighteous, unjust, an evil person, wrong, wicked, guilty, guilty of a violation of the law. We're in the wrong. It often describes unbelievers who hate God, who habitually are hostile towards God. The conduct of their life is as if God does not exist and they have no regard for him. And what does it say is true of them? They don't delight and meditate on the law of the Lord. It says they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now, not very many of us in this room are agrarian people, but I bet you know this analogy well enough that there are certain kinds of grain that literally they would go to the threshing floor during that and they would throw it up into the wind and the worthless parts are blown away and the parts worth eating and consuming are left. Um, maybe the closest to it, I read this and I thought, okay, I get that. You ever taken a peanut and cracked it open? Um, and you get those peanuts out of there, if you take the rest and do this in your hands, what happens to it? It just turns to dust. And if it was the slightest breeze, it's gone. That's what happens to the wicked. It's speaking of their end, that blessed are the people of God. Blessed are those who walk with God. Those who don't are judged. There are two eternal destruction, we might say. And it says they will not stand um, in the judgment. It also says, or in the congregation of the righteous. It points us to the fact that there will come a day, everyone will stand before the judgment throne of God and give an account for their lives. Everyone who stands before that throne is unrighteous by earthly and even holy standards, but there will be some numbered among those standing there who are right with God because of Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ, we only are left to be counted among the wicked. When the sheep and the goats are separated, those who are not united to Christ, those who don't love and honor Jesus Christ, will go to their eternal destruction. That's the reality of the scriptures over and over and over. Either we belong to Christ or we don't. It was true even of God's people. I want you to hear this. Uh, I don't have this on the screen up here, but uh, there's a prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 17 that's very similar to this psalm. And Jeremiah is preaching to the people of God, to Judah, the southern kingdom. Um, David writes this first psalm. These would be the people who come after David. Listen to what he says. He gives the opposite of blessed, and that is to be cursed, to be under the judgment of God. Thus says the Lord, says Jeremiah, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. We could stop there. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. If you're trusting in yourself or anyone else, it leaves us outside of the kingdom of God. But listen to what it goes on to say. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. See that picture again? If you don't delight, if you don't meditate, if you don't love God, if we're not in, found in Jesus Christ, we are like a dried up bush in the desert. Eventually we'll die and be blown away. He goes on to say something very similar. Evidently, Jeremiah had been reading Psalm 1. He says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its root by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for it leaves, its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. And then he says something I bet you've heard before. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? See, what happens is we have a heart that sometimes the wickedness within ourselves tells us that we don't need that water that comes only from God. And here's the last thing I want to point out to us is that yes, we get, we're either one or the other. Either we are sustained by God's provision or we're not. 
We're a tree planted by streams of water that flourishes or we are a dried up bush that will be blown away. But there's something in between that this psalm says to us that we're not to miss. It was these verses right in the middle. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. And its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. You know, we see these two people, the righteous and the wicked, the two destinations, heaven and hell. But the Christian life is not only about our ultimate destiny. Y'all have heard me use this phrase many times. Christianity is not a get out of hell free card. It's not an insurance policy for the end of our life. That it is to be, in fact, these men saying earlier about when I met the master, the words talked about being transformed even here and now. That we are becoming more and more like Christ even here on this earth. The Christian life should reflect the kingdom of God in us and around us and through us. When it says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. It means that God designed and desires for you to be a producer. Not just to survive this life, but to thrive in it. And more than that, you produce something that yields a crop. It's a joy to receive a blessing The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's a joy to receive a blessing. It's even greater joy that we have as believers in Jesus Christ to be a blessing. I love that Warren Wiersbe, if you know his name, is a Bible commentator. He says about this passage, there's three categories here. Not just the righteous and the wicked. He says there's the righteous who receive a blessing. There's the wicked who need a blessing. And in between, there are people who are a blessing. I want to encourage you today, first and foremost, to say, do I know Jesus Christ as my Savior? Have I received that life-giving nourishment that comes only by God through Jesus Christ? But secondly, if I have, am I a blessing? And I'll close with these words. How do I do that? If you say, I don't feel like I produce a lot of fruit, Jesus has a word for us. Let's look at John Chapter 15, he says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Maybe I should just stop there. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How do I delight in the law of the Lord? How do I meditate on it day and night? How can I be a producer of the kind of fruit God wants me to do? We have to be in Jesus Christ first and foremost. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. You see there's two categories. You produce fruit or you're thrown away and burned in the fire. God's not interested in plants that don't produce fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Listen to this last verse. As the, I'm sorry. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in me. Now, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you. Here's what Jesus says, that my joy may be in you, and that your, that your joy may be full. You see, Jesus says, I want you to be blessed. And you do that by belonging to Christ, by living in Christ, by being obedient to his word. There's the righteous and there's the wicked. Are you numbered among the righteous? Do you know Christ who's given himself for your sins? And if so, are you availing yourselves of it? Are you consuming the word of God? Are you going to the Lord in prayer? Are you giving of yourself for his purposes? I hope you're a producer of that kind of fruit and that you will remain in Christ, abiding in him day by day and moment by moment. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is... Our great joy to be numbered among the people of God. We are thankful uh, that you have chosen us. You've redeemed us by the blood of Christ and you've loved us 
uh, with a love that uh, overwhelms us. Um, it's a joy unspeakable, you've said to us. I pray that today, if there are those here this day who don't know Christ in that way, uh, who feel as though they have a dry uh, and thirsty soul, that you would cause them to come today to drink of the living water so that they will never thirst again. And for those who call upon Christ for their salvation, that today you would encourage uh, them to perseverance, uh, to love and good deeds, that we would uh, be those that produce great fruit, uh, that our delight uh, would be in Christ. Um, and we pray that uh, as we find ourselves uh, with these opportunities that we would trust in you to accomplish your will in us and through us. We thank you and we praise you for those things and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.